What a blessed privilege that God gave to women. Because the way that He made us, He knew very well that only women could handle womanhood, which makes the day in which we live so strange. On the 15th, uh, or pardon me, the 22nd, we're going to just, we're going to take that Sunday, uh, to exhort our families. We want to give a, a gift to those of you who are, who are in the throes of raising children to help you uh, if things like family worship. We're going to do that. And at that time, I'm going to be preaching on, on a matter that I think will address a lot of the silliness going on today, but I just want to preview that and to answer the question, how, how do we know, how do you know whether a person anymore is supposed to be a boy or supposed to be a girl, is supposed to be a man or supposed to be a woman, and, and it's, it's, it's not rocket science, there's a scripture, we're going to look at it, in the beginning God made them male and female. Never forget that. Pursue that within the bounds that God created us. It's when we lose touch with our Creator or when people try to convince us that there is no Creator that all manner of evil and confusion can arise. And so I, we, have a, we have a word, the church has a word today that we need to speak lovingly and clearly on this great confusion that's arisen concerning gender identity. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. This is one of my favorite passages. I use it in premarital counseling. I use it in marriage counseling. Not just these six verses, but verse 7 too. And men, hang on. A Father's Day is coming in June. We're going to visit this again. This isn't the first time I've looked at this with you. But it's a passage we keep coming back to time and time again because it is, it is such a multifaceted diamond and it shows us today we want to just turn in a little bit and look at this powerful beauty of biblical womanhood. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6, if you found that in your Bibles, I ask you to stand with me if you would. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen. I much prefer for you to hold your Bible and read it. If you don't have a Bible, don't possess one, then let us know and we want to put one in your hands. But this is the Word of God. Let's listen to this as I read, as I read this. You follow along in your Bibles. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, and, I, and really, do, do not let your adorning be merely external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious." There it is again, you see. The virtuous woman is... Who can, who can value, assign her value? And God's sight is very precious. But this is how the holy women, women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. What have we just read? We just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God in Oh, it has a, has a word for us today, a word for the ages, a word for the future today. And I want us, as we think about how Jesus Christ is altogether lovely, the fairest of 10,000, how He, in His wisdom, uniquely imparted a measure of that to women to shape the world one little heartbeat at a time. Thank you. Please be seated. He, Peter is here talking about how, uh, how Christians, the, the whole book of 1 Peter, if you know anything about it, is about persecution. He, he opens it up, writing it to those who have been scattered, to the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, who have been scattered across the, the, the earth. They called them the dispersion, or the dis diaspora. And so the whole book is about how, do, how does a Christian bear up under suffering? When you have a government that's opposed to you, how do you bear up under suffering? When when, when you maybe most of the Christians of the early church were slaves, there were not a whole lot of masters. Uh, Philemon is an example, an uh, exception to that. But how do you live in the face of great difficulty? 
great challenge. And so he's carrying this over, and, he, and don't misunderstand, he's not saying in the same way that a slave is to obey his or her master, a wife, that's not what he's doing. He's simply saying that this is also an arena where in the early church it would, would not have been unusual to find women who had come to faith in Christ whose husbands had not. So, the, so let's get the context right. The big picture here is, is women who are living with unbelieving husbands. But it's not exclusively that. When you drill down into it, uh, when we're going to look at this text again. If your husband does not obey the word. When a husband is being disobedient in an area of the word. God says, basically, harness. Harness the powerful beauty of biblical womanhood as a means to win, to rescue, to advance the glorious gospel of Christ. So we're going to look at that today. And I want us to see it just under four headings real briefly. First of all, there's the problem faced by far too many women. In verse 1a to, to the end of that verse. Secondly, the, the powerful beauty of biblical womanhood in verse, the last part of verse 1 and in verse 2. And then the prohibition against relying on feminine charm. And then fourth, the past as a pattern of powerful beauty, the powerful beauty of biblical womanhood. We're gonna, we need this. You see, we're, we're in a day now where increasingly that's the past. We've got to step up. We need, we need to be people who provoke godly women toward this model and encourage them. And we'll, we'll look at that. We'll look at that. So let's look first of all. The problem faced by far too many women. Verse 1, likewise wives, be subject. It's a word there. The word subject is the, is the Greek word that means voluntarily place yourself under uh, the leadership of. Be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word. Here was the, here's the tension, clearly. He's writing to women who had become followers of Jesus Christ, whose husbands were not yet. And, and if you've been in, in the journey any time at all, I mean, I've, I've been in ministry long enough now that I have, I have engaged where women have become followers of Christ and their husbands are not. And it's a real challenge. And particularly as they grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as they grow in understanding of the gospel and its implications, and the, and the husbands continue to be, to be ignorant and ignoramuses and in acting uh, in, a, in a wrong way, how, how difficult that becomes. And so Peter again is applying the principle of persevering under suffering. If the Lord Jesus tarries is coming and we live longer, we're going to get to see that in this nation. For too long we have watched with binoculars as the rest of the world has experienced the challenge of persevering under persecution and pressure and sadly I think uh, too many times kind of yawned at it oh isn't that, isn't that sad and it's tragic is what it is but the scripture speaks to it and we're going to need to learn it uh, in the days months and years coming so he gives this exhortation to be subject even if they don't obey the word the husband doesn't ask Sadly, too many of us, have, talking about men, have areas in our lives where we're being disobedient to the Word when it comes to our relationship with our wives. And we hurt them. We harm them. We frustrate them. We, we cause them to wonder about their own worth and, and, and their own preciousness. And, and that's wrong. We'll... We're going to take a look at that. Just, men, go ahead and read ahead, verse 7. We're going to look at that, Lord willing, in June, all right? It's interesting. Six verses to the women. One to the men. It's wrong when we do that. We're sinning against our wives. We're sinning against the goodness of God. What, what more precious can God give to us men than a, than a wife who follows Christ? I submit to you, Nothing. Nothing. A woman who understands scripturally that she, in a unique way, by God's 
design, and plan reflects to a world how precious Jesus Christ is because the church that follows Christ loves Him and wants to submit to Him. Paul says that in, in Ephesians. This is a mystery. When I talk about the, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, this is a mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and His church. And God blesses women with that challenge and with the corresponding grace capacity. And He gives those to us as gifts. And I promise you, men, I don't know what you think you need today, but if you have a woman who loves the Lord and fears the Lord, you have the most precious gift God could give you outside of your own salvation. So, far too many women face that. My mother was a shining example. I, I've told you before, I won't go into this again. But I, I remember growing up, and my dad, you know, my dad was a, was a terrible person, but my, my dad put on a suit every Sunday morning, and there he was in church, and he prayed in church, he took up the offering, he was on the deacon body, he taught Sunday school. Uh, but he was, he was a hell raiser when it came to his relationship to my mom, his wife. Married 62 years when, when she died. I remember women coming in the house, talking with her, exhorting her, you need to divorce him. You, you, don't, you don't need this. Walk away, we'll, we'll support you. She never would. It's tragic when a man mistreats a woman, when he neglects her, when he's unkind to her, when he, when he doesn't do what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 7, when he doesn't treat her with respect as someone who has her own peculiar weaknesses and yet regard her as a fellow heir of grace. It's, far too many women face that. And so women, I, I just repent to you as a man. I repent to my wife. I, my mother was raising us, and I know, I know there were times when she wondered, Lord, what did you do in giving me Billy? <laughs> Maybe even in a weak moment asked, what did I do to deserve Billy? There's a second thing. This, how, is, how do you meet that? How does a woman meet whether a man is full-scale, unconverted? I may be speaking to somebody here who lives with an unconverted husband. How do you meet that? How do you answer that? Well, you answer it with, with the God-given power expressed in the beauty of biblical womanhood. Look at verse, the rest of verse 1. Because wives, submit, submit yourselves to husbands who are being disobedient to the word so that they may be one without a word. Interesting play on words here. Your husband's being disobedient to the word. The word there is the gospel. It's logos, but it means the gospel. They're being disobedient to the gospel because a husband who's not loving his wife as Christ loved the church, striving to do that imperfectly, failingly, picking yourself back up and trying. The, the husband who's not doing that is, is being disobedient to the word. God instructs Peter to tell the women, win him without a word. He's not saying that without the gospel. What he's saying there is that, that the gospel comes powerfully both in word and in deed. In fact, if you read through 1 Peter with discernment, what you discover is that for Peter, faith was the expression of obedience to the word. And so he equated believing with faith doing with practicing the word several times in, in his uh, in fact let's just look at it real quickly in 1 Peter 1, 1 15 about the Lord who has called you he's, he's holy you also be holy in all your conduct there's this behavior for him it's, it's how, what you do how you act listen to what he's going to tell the wives 1 Peter 2 12 keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that they, when they speak against you as evildoers they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation then again 1 Peter 3 2 which we're reading when they see your respectful and pure conduct and then 1 Peter 3 16 on down having a good conscience so that when you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame in other words for Peter this is in all dimensions whether it's a believer relating to his government a believer relating to the Gentiles, his peers, whether a woman relating to, a, to an unconverted or unbelieving or, or disobedient husband. It is, it is the conduct. There's a, there's a challenge here. Win them without a word. 
You've heard the adage. What you're doing shouts so loudly I can't hear what, you're, what you say. I, I told you about the woman years ago that uh, came to me one day frustrated. Her husband, he was, you know, he had his name on a membership roll, but he never darkened the doors of the sanctuary to gather with the people of God. Smug in the thought that he was a believer, but he, he was being disobedient. And she came to me and she said, I just, I'm so frustrated. And she'd been married a long time, and this wasn't a newlywed. This is, you know, decades. I'm so frustrated. I said, my husband, I can't get him to come to church. I just, for anything. I said, well, what, tell me about the dynamics. She said, well, for example, this past Sunday, I was walking out the door and I said, I guess you're not coming again today, are you? Now, now that's not, that's not Peter's admonition. <laughs> that's not winning without a word. Uh, it's not a gag order on women. I think it assumes, in fact, that you will communicate, that you will speak the gospel. If, you're, if, we're to, if we're to teach the gospel to every creature, if we're to share the good news with those outside of us, then certainly those under whose roof we share, we should be speaking the gospel. But, but finally, women, this, this, is the, this is the powerful beauty of biblical womanhood. Finally, it is your godly adornment, your, your, this, this inner person, this heart that we're going to look at here. That is so compelling. And I've lived long enough to see that happen too. Where a woman in loving submission, not, not to those things that are immoral, not, not to those things that would, that would put her against her Savior. In other words, if a, if a husband says, you're, you just, you're not going. I'm not going to let you go. If you're going to be my wife, you're not going to go. No. You don't submit to that because at that point you say, and I've had to counsel women to say, dear, I love you, I love you, but I must obey God rather than this. I love God more. Which, by the way, is good for any man if your wife loves God more than she loves you. This winning. Winning them to what? Not winning them over to her way, but winning them to Christ. Or, or in the case of a husband who is a believer who's lost his way, who's... Who, he doesn't have the teaching in his background to know how to love a woman, to know how to lead a woman, to know how to walk before her following Christ when he's, when he's missing on those things. No excuse for it. He needs to get his act together and, and put himself under a tutor or a mentor who will teach him and train him in that. But when that's happening, you want to win him to Christ. You want to win him back to his Savior. Because you see, in the same way, a husband is blessed who has a wife who's following Christ. A wife is blessed, and, and I've talked to them enough. To, there's, guys, there's nothing a woman wants more than a man who follows Christ. That's the safest place in the world for a woman to be. is with a man who is faithfully, obediently following Christ. So look, let's look 30. He, he talks about this... Uh, it's winning them. Look at the, there's this prohibition against relying on feminine charm. And, and you could almost preach a series on that, but I want to just look at this real quickly. He says, do not let your adorning be, and, and, and I really think that, that he's not, Peter's not teaching don't wear clothes, all right? Nor is he teaching something sanctified about just looking plain. That, that's, but he's teaching about where you put the emphasis. So, so I, don't, I think it's honest to the text to say, do not let your adorning be merely external, the braiding of hair, and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. You know, if you read some of the early writers that were writing about this time, they were saying similar things. Uh, Juvenile, for example, one of the writers said, there's nothing that a woman will not permit herself to do, nothing that she deems shameful when she encircles her neck with green emeralds and fastens pearls through her elongated ears. What are elongated ears? I, mean, I don't know how you get them. I guess wait, I've seen some men who were headed that way with some things. I guess if you wear something heavy enough, long enough. There's nothing more intolerable than a wealthy woman. That, that's, that's juvenile. He goes on to say, so important is the business of beautification, so numerous are the tears and stories, like a building, piled upon one another on her head. 
And then Plutarch, another writer, said, It is not gold or, or precious stones or scarlet that makes her such, that is decorous, but whatever invests her with that something which betokens dignity, good behavior, and modesty. Very interesting. That they recognize something about the woman, something feminine, femininely powerful about the woman, feminist charm, but they didn't, didn't make the connection. Peter makes the connection. Don't let it be merely this. In other words, don't call attention to, to your external... Women, do you understand the power of feminine charm? Do you know that you can use that to melt a man into a puddle? That you can use that to manipulate? You can dress a certain way, walk a certain way, smell a certain way, bat your eyes a certain way, and a man will become putty in your hands unless he's just a hard-hearted fellow. God wired you with a powerful beauty, but you see, you don't, you don't drive your goals externally. Listen to what he says here. But, verse 4, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Paul talks about something imperishable in 1 Corinthians 15 when he's talking about the resurrection. He says, this, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. He's talking about the, the newness that we will be in totality when we come before the Lord in the resurrection. Peter is saying, women, you have that in you. This imperishable. This beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. And then he says it, which in God's sight is very precious. Now I'm going to tell you something. When the scripture says God values this, then we ought to stop. All antenna go up and say what? And here it says it. Precious in God's sight. Is, is the woman who recognizes that the way God has put her together, there is a, there's an intrinsic beauty about it. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to demean men here. But, you know, probably the first thing that attracted us to you was not how you prayed. There'll be some exceptions to that. Not how you read the Bible. Not how you answered in Sunday school. We saw you. And you were beautiful in our eyes. There's nothing wrong with that. What he's saying here is don't let that be what people ultimately, primarily see of you. This hidden person of the heart, it's not to stay hidden. In fact, you read Peter correctly, it can't stay hidden. The only way, the only way you could try to hide it is if, if, you, if you mask it over. But a follower of Jesus Christ who's fair and flourishing as, as John Bunyan spoke of them in the Pilgrim's Progress, it's gonna, what's on the inside is going to work itself out. Paul said this in, in Romans. He said, stop being conformed to this world. Stop, stop putting on what the world puts on to be who you are. But rather, keep on being transformed. You, if you've studied that passage, you know the Greek word. There's metamorphosis. From the inside out, be changed from the inside out. What's changing in the inside should work itself out of you. He said this to the Philippians. Continue working out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is continually working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. We work it out because God's working it in. That's what He's saying to women here. Women, there's something very powerful about you that goes much deeper than skin deep. This hidden person of the heart. It's imperishable. And it's an imperishable beauty. What, what's He implying there? What we just read in Proverbs 31, that beauty, beauty fades. And it does with age. But mercifully, the men that you're married to as you age mature, and we see beauty differently than we did. We see your beauty as it works itself out and how powerful that is for us. Paul said this in 1 Timothy 2, 9, and 10. He's speaking about something similar that Peter is. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. Notice that. How do, you, how do you adorn yourself with self-control? That's working from the inside out, folks. Modesty is a mentality. You can wear a toad sack and be immodest. It's a mentality. 
works itself from the inside out, to adorn yourself with that. Not with braided hair and gold, pearls, or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. You see the connection there? It's all faith that works. Faith that works. James said, uh, you say you believe, show me your fruit. Show me the fruit of your faith. It's a common theme through Scripture. Not salvation by works, but salvation that produces good works. That adorns the gospel. And you can imagine, if you think about it for a minute, that a woman who would come into an early setting of the church, when, when, when these churches struggled financially to even feed their members, and someone would come in with an ostentatious look and challenge people to think, well, you know, that we, we have some needs here. The power there, the power. Well, I need to, I need to move quickly. I want you to look at this past, the past as pattern of the powerful beauty of biblical womanhood. Now, so he's, he's established this, and it's not cultural, because he makes an appeal to history. So it's theological. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God, what, what's he saying there? Reflect to people that you hope in God, that your hope is in God. And everything he said thus far should put them hoping in God. What's your, what is the hope of a woman who lives with a, woman, a husband who's being disobedient to the word? Is it that somebody will slap him upside the head and get his attention? Not, not, he can get distracted again. It's that God will honor the desires of her heart and give her the husband she longs to have. Whether in the case, give her a husband who follows Christ so that she'll have a Christian home. Or give her a husband who's a follower of Christ who's lost his way. And who needs to come back home to his faith. He said the women in the past hoped in God. They, this is how they adorned themselves from the inside out. By submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord. Now just sometime read, uh, read Genesis, uh, I think it's 18, 12. That's the, uh, that's the context of this. In Genesis 18, 12, Sarah says she laughed when, when he, Abraham told her that she was going to have a child. After I'm worn out, and my Lord, notice she calls him Lord there, is old, shall I have pleasure? She was making light or just responding in, a, in, a, in an unbelievable giddiness. But in, even in that, she called him Lord. She did not say, well, what are you, stupid? And my Lord is old. Shall I have pleasure? I know we don't have time to develop it, but there's two times in, the, uh, in Genesis 12 and Genesis just 20 when, when Abraham tries to pass her off as his kinsman, not his wife, so he can avoid the trouble of the man who, whose eye she caught. He was willing to let her going with him. I mean, that's... She called that fellow Lord. Now, some of you may be struggling, ladies, and, and I, I want you to know the church prays for you and with you, and, and we want to come alongside you and your man and say to him, get it in gear. Maybe struggling with the man you're, you're married to, but I don't think there's anybody here who can say, well, Pastor, what about the time we were walking down the street and these thugs jumped out and the guy said, here, take my wife. I don't think that's happened to anybody. I hadn't gotten down to that. And she said as the example, godly women of old. They submitted to their own husbands. Sarah obeyed her husband, calling him Lord. And you are her children. Here's where I want to wrap it up now. You are her children if you do good, if you practice the goodness that Peter's already described. That is, working out from within you that, that gentle, quiet spirit, that, that, that heart that is so precious, that is captivating and compelling, and the same external feminine charm that can melt a man into a puddle is much more powerfully expressed from the inside out, this godly charm which will melt that same man, not so much to a puddle, but will melt his heart. Convict him of his sin and convince him of his wrongness. Because God uses that. 
He uses that. You're her children. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. It's fascinating. He piles on the word fear here. What would be the fear of a woman who has a husband that's unbelieving? Is that it's going to continue that way? That it's just going to get worse? That the more she grows in grace, the more they're going to grow apart? And he will finally have had enough, and he may harm her. In this day, the first century, he may just put her away. He may send her to the streets, which would make her then liable, susceptible to become a prostitute to, to make ends meet. There's, there would be great temptation to attach fearfulness to such a situation. He says, but oh, so he, he calls you. And I call you today, ladies. We, we thank God for you. If you're a mother raising children, it's the hardest job on the planet. If you're a grandmother, now getting to exhort your daughters and speak in the lives of your grandchildren. Challenging, difficult, challenging, different. A great-grandmother who holds a baby and just all the flood tides that rush over you of how precious it is to hold a newborn baby. We understand something, women. Mentally, I'll, I'll never understand experientially the challenge you go through. But you're in this, if you follow Christ, you're in this with a helper in the Lord, His Holy Spirit, who has promised to use you. And I want to, I want to say this to you. Has used you more than you know. Please understand, there had to be a time in my mother's life when she thought, I am a miserable failure as a parent. She gave me the opportunity as a teenager one time. She said, you know your youth Christmas party is on the same night as this dance you've told me you want to go to. I'm going to let you choose. I chose the dance. It broke her heart. And I came home from that dance was okay. I couldn't dance. I don't know why I even went. But... And she was sitting up weeping for me. You see, there are times, ladies, when you think it's all for naught. But it's not. You are changing lives. You, by God's grace, you are speaking into the lives of children. By God's grace, you are... Do you realize what a miserable wretch your husband would be if you turned this charm not in a godly way, but in a devastating way. I met man after man after man in seminary whose wife was an albatross around his neck. That's the power you have. God's given it to you. It's a power to bless or a power to curse. And so, my challenge to you this morning is be a daughter of Sarah. Enlist in the sorority of Sarah. And purpose under God that you will not give up. You will, you will not give in to the fear that things are not going to get better. But that you will hope in God. And that you will take who God has made you and commit to Him to grow in the grace and, and knowledge of Christ and the likeness of Christ. And commit, Lord, use me. Use me to, to touch my husband. To bless my husband. Use me to bless my children. And don't let the devil wrap me up in me. Help me be wrapped up in Christ. And use that way that you've devised me, developed me, made me, molded me to reflect Jesus Christ. So that when people see a godly woman in a home, in a church, in a world, and want to know how in the world she's keeping her mind when everyone else around her is losing theirs. What a great opportunity you have to speak of the powerful, saving mercy and grace of God and how He keeps you and preserves you and has blessed you to see in life the opportunities to be a blessing to others. Thank God for godly women. Godly women keep the church moving forward when men get distracted when men go off to war, when, when men lose their way. No excuse for it. Hang around. Middle of June, we'll look at that. But today I want you to know, women, we thank God for you. Never despise what He's called you to do. Always seize the opportunity to bless 
the man he's put into your life, to prepare the young ladies in your lives who do not yet have men that they're going to join in marriage with, to prepare them to be the blessings that we need, this generation needs, as it's losing its way. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to be led by the Savior. And I thank you for these women here today who, who do submit themselves to our Savior and who are led by Him and, uh, in the path that He prepares to walk. And I just pray that you'll bless them, that, that today they'll be reminded of how, how, how they are loved, how they are appreciated. And it wouldn't just happen one time a year, Lord. That we would be faithful stewards to let them know what a difference they are making how you are using them to change the world, to shape the young ladies who will be godly women, to shape the young men who will grow up to look for godly women to join themselves to. We thank you for them. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ because you see the only way we can have a hope that these women will, will be godly is because grace has found them and is changing them and shaping them. Help us to be an encouragement to that, not a hindrance to that. Help us to bless and not add to their frustration. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we're going to sing and be uh, dismissed. If you, if you have an interest...